Welcome back to Expert Instruction, the Teach by Design podcast where we dive deeper into the research surrounding student behavior by talking with the people implementing these practices, where they work, and with the students they support. I'm Megan Cave. And I'm Nadia Sampson. We did it! We arrived at the end of the school year. It's June, and that means so many of you have already kicked off your well-deserved summer break. We hope that this time can be a time for some rest, a time for you to refill your cup with whatever it is that you like. And maybe it could be also a time for some reflection. Last year, we told you all about a study that found that when we use our time to reflect on what we've done, we score higher on tests, it improves our efficiency, we feel more capable about how we're doing a task, and we understand the assignment better than people who could use that same amount of time for more practice. Ever since we learned about the power of reflection, we decided to spend a little time every June looking back on the conversations we had here on this podcast and what we learned along the way. This year, we tried some new things together. In November, we added a co-host. Nad has been a colleague and a friend of mine since the day I started working here. We've worked together and then separately on some projects. And to reconnect here has been so wonderful. It's always nice to try new things with the people you've known the longest. We also, she and I, took this show on the road In April, we presented at the Northwest PBIS conference to a room full of educators. Like, what was it like? Almost two, like nearly 200 people. It was was like five gajillion. Yeah, I think that's the more accurate number. (laughs) (laughs) Um, When when Nad and I release these episodes into the ether, it's always hard to know whether they resonate or how helpful they are to you and your work. And not only at that conference were we able to watch people's reactions in real time, but we also got the opportunity to meet so many of you who listen to our conversations every month. You gave us such good feedback, you asked such thoughtful questions, and you encouraged us to keep going. We can't say enough about how grateful we are to be able to engage in this work, to share it every month, and to learn from the field right alongside you. Expert Instruction is a monthly podcast. We've delivered 10 episodes this year. This is number 11. We've had 21 guests, and you guys have pressed play 6,794 times this year to listen to our conversations. Wow. Today, we're going to highlight just five of the lessons that we learned from five of those conversations. But please feel free, share with us the lessons that you learned too. Okay, first lesson, lesson number one, approach your work with intention and community. This lesson around intention and purpose has become something of a resonating theme, actually, for the entire year. And it came out of our conversation with Dr. Nicole Holland Sims in our very first episode in August. Uh, My guess is that no matter where you work, that place where you work has a mission statement. And if you're lucky, You might even have a vision statement, but what about a purpose statement? I know. At the time, I didn't have one of those either. I do now. A vision statement lays out where you're going. It describes the future that you envision as a result of the work you do. A mission statement tells you how you're going to get there. It defines who you are, what you do, and who you do it for. Your purpose statement defines the why of it all. It's your reason for showing up to do the work in the first place. Yeah, the reason, that, yeah. I didn't have that. And as I talked with Nicole, I shared about, I shared with her that my purpose helped me keep showing up because if I didn't show up for that, who was going to? And that's when Nicole, in the way only coaches can, affirmed my feelings. She said, yes. I I see where you're coming from. And she gave me one of those yes and statements. Yes. And also she reminded me that while purpose is important, it grounds our work with intention. We cannot let it override us because that's how burnout happens. Instead, she encouraged all of us to cultivate our coalition of the willing, those people within our community who show up with a similar goal and purpose. We can do more as a group than any one of us can do alone. 
And for that reason, I've made vision and purpose an integral part of every team and project I lead. We kick off the work by establishing what we want to see as a result of our effort and why we want to achieve it. The exercise gives us a frame for the project and guides every decision we make. When there's a question about whether we should do something, we go back to the vision and purpose and ask ourselves, how does the decision help us accomplish the goals we set at the beginning? Establishing purpose with intention, cultivating a community invested in achieving that goal, and working together to see it through has been such a revelation for me this year. Okay. Lesson number two, pause. Implicit biases are sneaky. We don't even know what they are sometimes, and yet they can really affect our decisions and our reactions in ways that are inequitable, punishing, and unfair to the people around us. In schools, they can even translate to really negatively impacting the student academic and social outcomes that we're also working hard to achieve. We had the opportunity to talk with Drs. Maria Reina Santiago Rosario and Sean Austin about the work and research they're doing to help educators identify their vulnerable decision points, or VDPs, as an entry point to address inequitable student outcomes. So VDPs are times when we respond to a situation, a person, or some event in a way that doesn't align with our beliefs and our values. In other words, without knowing it and not intentionally, our implicit biases influence how we treat people, including the ways we deliver consequences for some student behavior and not others. So during our conversation with Maria and Sean, one thing that really stuck with me was the idea of the pause. Pausing and changing direction or decision may not be the easiest thing to do when we're heated or frustrated or feeling really fired up. But what Maria and Sean told us is that their research is showing that it makes a big difference for educators and their students. So my job requires that I do a lot of training and presenting. And before the pandemic, I did a lot of travel. And those are also the things that caused me a huge amount of anxiety. And when I'm anxious, I'm prone to being less than thoughtful, (laughs) patient, and dare I say it, professional. (laughs) I reflected, I was really thinking and reflecting on what Maria and Sean talked about. And I realized that these are VDPs for me. So part of my new routine when I'm training is practicing the pause. I often ask folks to restate their question, and this really gives me a chance to pause and take a breath and respond thoughtfully. Whether or not this VDP is about a bias I carry or not, I have an opportunity to be a teacher, a presenter, or a traveler (laughs) that I want to be and that people can actually learn from. So when we know the moments that are most vulnerable to our biases, we can really be much more intentional about how we react to things happening around us, which brings me to the next lesson. Lesson three, talk about things even when you don't know how. The thing about VDPs is once you know yours, you can't unknow them. And once you know them, there's this opening for us to talk about equity and disproportionality. Even with the door open, though, these can be really hard conversations, so hard that we might even avoid them altogether because we don't even know where to start. So when I first heard about implicit biases and VDPs, I was really skeptical. Um, It just sounded like some kind of watered down way of talking about systemic racism, just another way that we could avoid the real issue. And maybe there's a little bit of truth in that, but we don't know what we don't know. So finding a way to bring attention to what I am doing to contribute to the problem helps me get a place, get to a place where I can feel like I can have an impact. I can make changes to my own behavior and recognize when what I'm doing is being influenced influenced by my own sneaky biases. Mm -hmm. That is something I can do something about. And once I know what it is that I'm doing to contribute to inequity in schools or anywhere, 
I feel compelled to do things differently. I can own what I'm doing, my VDPs, and start to know the biases I carry. Then, and only then, can I do things differently. So in schools, looking at real data and analyzing um, that data allows for the identification of groups of students who are overrepresented, like students of color, students with IEPs. And this way, conversations can begin about identifying the who, the what, the when, the where, and the why of behavior incidents, which leads us to be much more precise. We get to precise statements that really allow for precise problem statements. Prob whoop. Yes, problem solving. Problem solving. Yes, Sorry. that's okay. <laughs> it was a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so teams can begin to see where implicit bias may be impacting their decision-making, their VDPs, and coach staff on implementing neutralizing routines. So no one is saying that this will solve of systemic course. racism. Yes. It's not. It's a part of it. But is it, it is an entry part or a foot in the door in the right direction. It's someplace to start. Mm -hmm. We all walk around with our stuff, the stuff we learned, the stuff that helped us and the stuff that hurt us. Figuring out what we are doing that contributes to perpetuating systemic racism is messy and scary and it's hard. Do it anyway. Do it. Talk about the things, even when you don't know how. Lesson number four, prioritize your unstructured time when you can. Mostly, you guys, my job is a creative one. I get to create content that doesn't exist. And then I send it out into the world for people to read and listen to and think about. And that has its, its perks for sure, except for those times when the creativity, she is fully log jammed. The Word documents, they sit blank for days and those deadlines, they only get closer and closer. As educators, you must feel that pressure too. The day that lesson plan is due looms big and there isn't uh, anything coming to mind about how to get it finished. Well, after our conversation with Nellie Huggins and Dr. Michelle Bommel, I decided to do what they encourage kids to do when a reset is in order play. Whether you call it recess, brain breaks, free play, it's all just designate, uh, designated unstructured time during the day where students get to explore something on their own. They direct the work. They choose the parameters, the subject, the materials, and then they just have at it. When we give them the space to do that, they practice their communication skills, social norms, transitions, collaboration, self-regulation, all the things that we want them to get better at. They do it when they play. And on the academic side of things, times like recess help students take what they learned at their desks and transfer those skills to the playground with their peers. And that's the secret that we'll never tell them, that when they play, they're actually still learning. So as a grown-up, when I make room for this kind of thing during my workday, it kind of feels like when you pull out a junk drawer, dump everything out on a table, and then sort through all the things, throw out all the garbage, and organize what's left back into the drawer. Only in this case, the drawer is actually my brain and the stuff inside are my jumbled up ideas that I've accumulated over time. And no, I, you guys, I'm not taking a break to go play restaurant with my friends or swing on the monkey bars at recess, but I am making time during the day especially on days when I feel stagnant in my work, to do something that I want to do, a thing that's easy, that gives me enough time to shake out my junk drawer, free up some space, and give me that creative energy I can carry over into my work. We all need that kind of freedom. Recess helps your students engage in the business of learning, and coffee breaks help you consider your work from a new perspective. I'm all about those coffee breaks, Megan. Oh, yeah, anytime. <laughs> Lesson number five, your school-wide community is so much bigger than you think. In May, we had the opportunity to talk to a couple of different folks about student mental health. First, we talked to Megan Schultz, a com the community coordinator for an organization called the 15th Night, which serves unaccompanied, unaccompanied. It's a, it's a lot of it's syllables. It's a big word. It's a big unaccompanied. word. Yeah. Unaccompanied homeless youth to get the support they need within their communities. 
We also talked to Kelly Perales, a, num a member of the Midwest PBIS Network, about the Interconnected Systems Framework, or ISF which is all about using school-wide community expertise to embed mental health within a school's PBIS framework. My experience working with mental health experts in schools is pretty limited. So every so often, a mental health professional would attend a PBIS tier two or tier three meeting at a school where I was to talk about students identified by the team as needing mental health services. The mental health professional was from a community agency and was assigned, you know, a certain number of hours per week or month to provide services to students at that school. From what I saw, this model of delivery wasn't super successful. And after talking with Megan and Kelly, I think I have a better understanding of why. In the scenario that I described, mental health wasn't really embedded in the systems or practices at the school, nor was the mental health professional really seen as a real member of the teams that were using data for decision making. Right. It was like siloed, kind of. Perfect word for it, siloed. Yes. So I was blown away when Megan shared how she right? engaged. I, I really was. How she engaged schools and local community professionals to respond to requests for help for homeless youth. Her, her, her organization set up this super cool system so that when a student had a need, any student, a communication went out to local service, social service agencies yeah. and any agency that could help respond it. What? Right. A need arises. Yes. And agencies just respond and fulfill the need crazy so crazy it was like, but it, it happens it still it does. does it's awesome and the need is identified by any school personnel for any student so this isn't exactly what the isf lays out for right. embedding services into schools but still effective all the same for sure so kelly also told us a whole bunch more about how schools that have embedded the Interconnected Systems Framework, or ISF, mm -hmm. into their PBIS framework actually serve more students, and how mental health clinicians became regularly attending members on those PBIS teams, and how everyone increased their understanding of how mental health impacts student behavior. Right. They're linked, guys. They're linked. By working more closely with mental health professionals and school personnel, could better meet the needs of students. Mm -hmm. So mental health became this integrated part of conversations and the PBIS framework rather than this add-on outside siloed service. Exactly. So these conversations really highlight the fact that your school-wide community is so much bigger than just the people you see in the hallways every day. Your community extends to the neighborhoods around the, your building, the agencies who work with the same populations as you do, the families who support your students, the churches, the community centers, and after school hubs where folks hang out. Right. There are so many resources you can tap into for support in the things you're trying to achieve in your school. So do that. Right. Megan knocked on doors and started asking, and she heard so many more yeses than noes. Part of that is because she's really passionate about the work, but the other part of it is because she shared the same goal that they did, to offer up the support students need so they can move beyond just surviving and really start thriving, which is what we all want for our students. Exactly. That last lesson was such a full circle moment for me. We started out the year focused on intention and building something as a community. And to, so to end the year talking with our guests about just how big that community is really made me feel like so many of those big goals and aspirations that we have for what our schools can be might actually be possible. So I don't know. Well, now that's it. These are, oh, these are five of the lessons we learned wow. this year, but believe us, there are so many more that, I mean, we talked to so many people. We did. We want to thank all of our guests for the time they took to share their stories with us and with all of you. And we want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen. 
Nad and I are going to take a little break in July, but don't worry. We'll be back on the third Tuesday in August with a brand new episode to kick off our fourth season of expert instruction. Yes. Unbelievable. I can't even believe that's a true I can't statement. Either. I can't either. Fourth? Unreal. Until then, we want to say congratulations on another school year. Thank you guys for all the ways that you showed up for your students, for all the ways you showed up for each other, and for all the ways you continue to make your schools better places for everyone. From all of us at PBIS Apps, we wish you a restful and reflective summer, and we'll see you guys in the fall. Yay. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.